ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930 present The Drive. It is Thursday, April 13th. Your drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. We're going to get your text in this hour. 304-396-TALK. 304-396-8255. Now, if you've listened to this show long enough, you know that we usually take our guest interviews um, a few minutes after the show open and give you an opportunity to, to kind of find out who's going to be on the show. No, no, no. We've changed things up because joining me now on the program, on the road, as the herd is getting set to take on Coastal Carolina, is uh, Marshall standout pitcher Sydney Nestor. She is with us now, and... I don't do this for everybody, Sydney. Just you. You get to determine when you come on this show. Nobody else. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I love the first time, and I'm happy to be back for, for a second time. I appreciate you doing this. Um, I I forgot to ask you one question when we were speaking last time that okay. I, I've been wanting to ask ever since. Um, you mentioned to me that when you were inducted into the Hall of Fame you know, back at yeah, you know, back at your hometown yeah. – uh, yep. you, you said it was a big deal. Yeah, that your parents knew about this, and, and this was a, a big deal for them because you know they were aware of what this was. And I, I should have asked you, and I wanted to ask, what did they say when you got inducted into the Hall of Fame and you found out? Um, well, they actually got the um, – well, my high school principal, he uh, texted my dad and was like, hey, can I have Sydney's number? And um, I think we all kind of – suspected that this is possibly what it could have been about and so my parents uh I specifically my dad he texted me and said hey um you know Mr. Thompson your principal he's wanting your phone number to reach out for some information and he was like you know I think this is this is the time that this you know you might be getting inducted and so they were just extremely excited and I actually think that my grandparents uh who were there to see me be inducted into the hall of fame they probably were more excited and just happy to see me in person, you know, back from school again, but also to be inducted um, in front of our hometown and their hometown where they grew up first. And so I think that was extremely special, even more so for my grandparents and my parents, but my, my parents specifically, they too were just super excited for me. Um, just love coming back to our hometown and um, getting to see everybody and um, just kind of representing our hometown. See, that was it. That was the reason why I had you on. I just need to ask that one question. That was it to get it off my chest. <laughs> no, I wanted to ask that. I kicked myself after talking to you. I'm thinking, I just missed a great opportunity to find out what her parents thought. And now you just told me your grandparents were even more excited. So, uh, yeah, now that for we, sure they were. Now that we've taken care of that old business uh, on the road, taking on Coastal Carolina. What do you know about Coastal? Let's just talk about the game briefly before we get into uh, the season with you so far. Um, what's Coastal look like yeah. to you? Um, so David and I were actually kind of talking a little bit before um, this call, but we played them last year, and I know last year they were a tough team. They, you know, were in the game 100% uh, defense, offense, pitching. Um, I think we went one-to-one -one against them last year. They were just gritty, um, just made a lot of – things happen on their end and so um, I'm expecting this weekend to be tough I'm expecting it to be you know nose to the grindstone type games and so I'm just uh, we're just taking game by game and just kind of sticking to what we do best and um, like I said just one game at a time and so that's what we're going to stick to. My guest is Marshall's standout pitcher Sydney Nestor on the road and as to her getting set for Coastal Carolina is it is it a whirlwind the way this season has been going so far? So much success, yeah. You know, I think when talking to you last, you were kind of expecting this. Is is this how you saw the season going, or has this exceeded your expectations so far? Um, I think a little bit of both. I think last fall, I knew that this team had a, a ton of potential. You know, with our kind of vamped up pitching staff, um, a lot of the speed and utility that we have on our team, and so. I think just seeing that kind of fall into place last fall in our fall games and practices and stuff, I kind of had those expectations that this spring was going to be a truly special and memorable one. Um, and so for it to kind of lay out the way that it has so far, it has been truly a gift and, and super special for me and 
for my teammates. And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I expected it, but at the same time, it's kind of been more exciting and more fun. And um, it's been an honor to be on this team, to be honest. And so, um, yeah, a little bit of both, a little bit of expected it, but also it's kind of met and exceeded my expectations. What's your early evaluation of the league? I know you haven't faced everyone yet, but you've had so much success against Sunbelt competition. You know, is it just this Marshall team is that much better, or you know, what's the quality of competition like in the Sun Belt? Because we, we see the record, we see the win-losses, and we're thinking Marshall's just rolling almost everyone. You know, the competition, though, is it, is it a lot better than maybe those uh, box scores indicate? I think that the competition in the Sun Belt has been um, a lot tougher than kind of what I was expecting. Um, but like I said, when we just stick to what we do and what we do best, you know, things just fall into place and, and we get things done. We score runs. We, you know, are solid on defense. And so um, really the teams that we played so far, they have all, you know, have not been taken lightly whatsoever and so just sticking to what we do best like I said it's just that's our magic and and I just there I don't know Sunbelt has been tough and I we haven't seen um everybody yet and so we're just not taking anybody too lightly not you know hyping anybody up quite yet and so we're just um just hanging in there doing what we do now that the win streak's over um you guys pretty mad about that, not uh, not continuing that streak? Maybe go out and start a new streak? You know, of course, you, you had some success the other day on the road. Now in league play again, pretty pretty mad that streak is over, looking to start a new one? Yeah, I mean, um, to say that we were pissed is, uh, you know, might be a little bit of a understatement, you know, after that. And just having a lot of success, and then all of a sudden you lose, and you just kind of feel a little bit defeated. Um, but you know, those feelings, I think, were, you know, not lived, you know, very long. They're kind of short term. And so now we're just focused on the next game and sticking to what we do and what we do best. And, um, yeah, we didn't take it lightly, but it's something that we can't fret on it too much. Um, and we just got to keep moving forward. So after Coastal, with the three-game series, you're back home on the 18th, and you won't be on the road again until the May 4th, 5th, and 6th series against Georgia Southern. You've got JMU coming in. You have Texas State coming in. You also have Virginia Tech, and you have Alabama. Now, I know that this team does not look too far ahead. How hard has it been to stay focused on Coastal Carolina and not worry about all the pomp and the circumstance of a, a top-level team like Alabama coming into the dot? Well, honestly, I think before the season, we were all kind of, you know, excited to face Alabama and to have this next two or so weeks of, you know, of tough games in a row. And now that it's next week, it's kind of hard to believe how fast, you know, time has flown by. And um, But like I said, you know, I'm – we're just focusing on tomorrow. And, and yesterday we focused on, you know, going to Moorhead State and facing them, and we got the job done there. And so now we just need to use this weekend one game at a time, but also we're just going to take one game at a time to get better, to strengthen our strength, um, to fix a few things up, and then, you know, next Tuesday we'll roll around, and then we're going to give them a good game. My guest is Sydney Nestor now. Sydney, of course, is one of the standouts for the softball team, but I got to be careful because if I just say it's just you, I'm going to make someone else mad. You are surrounded by so much talent, and I'll give you the opportunity. Who's standing out to you? Where uh, where are you looking at when you see this team and go, "Wow, she's having a great season," or she's she's really uh, making it happen for us? I think all around. I mean, you know, a lot of eyes are on Autumn Owen, and you know her power in the box but also her just being a complete wall um, with me as part of the battery behind the plate. She's just been outstanding. Um, I think also bringing Sydney Bickle in at shortstop, that's something that uh, she has filled in a good spot for us at short, and she is just smooth as all get out, and she's fast. Um, tons of different utilities that she can use, and she's, I think, had a great season, first season with the herd. Um, also, um, 
Alex Coleman. I think she's come around, you know, after her injury last year, she's come around and absolutely just done it all for us and started our uh, offense and also being um, great in the outfield. Uh, I think also um, Grace, you know, in center, she has taken her fifth year and just run with it. And she's been great both offensively and defensively. Um, She's been awesome. And um, to see her in the four hole this year is just awesome. She's just taken that spot with grace and she's, she's been great. Um, Also um, Cam, our third baseman, she's just been so gritty and made a ton of good plays and come around offensively. And so honestly, there's not, I mean, everybody just does their part. We've got people who come in off the bench, uh, people who are, you know, traditional starters, and everybody just does their job. Everybody has had a great season so far, um, and I'm just so excited to be able to play with them and pitch with them. And so um, everybody's just been top notch for sure. City Nestor's with us on the road. You, you're right now. You're what, in a lobby. You haven't even checked in your room yet, right? Is that is that the deal? Yeah, uh, we probably pulled up maybe 20 minutes ago. I took my luggage off the bus, put it into my room, came down, met David. We're sitting in the hotel lobby uh, right next to the Continental Breakfast. And so, um, yeah, we're back in the hotel. Wait a minute, Continental Breakfast still going on right now? Well, I mean, they've got, like, the bars and stuff set up for, like, the juices and whatnot, but... It's, it's, it's in the same area as, as where we're sitting. Okay, I was going to say, you, you've grabbed one, right? You, you already got some juice. <laughs> yeah. No, they're taking better care of you, right? You got the, you got the ride on the uh, on the herd cruiser, that luxury bus there. They're taking good care of you. Yep, yep, that's the one. And now after this, you're off to uh, what's what's mealtime like on the road for Thundering Herd softball? What's uh, What's this all about? Um, I mean, they, they treat us nice and we, we get, you know, solid dinners, breakfast, lunches, um, more than we could eat. We have snacks. Um, we have literally food at all times of the day. Um, but we, so we just got here and we have a later practice this evening. And so we are currently having dinner and so we're going to have that and then head to practice and, um, but um, the meals that we have, they're great. They keep us fueled. Um, and, you know, like I said, food, food at 24-7 pretty much. My guest, Sydney Nestor, Thundering Herd softball pitcher. We didn't even talk about it. i got to get this out before we, uh, we let you go. Um, the Marcos, the, uh, the revamped Marshall Awards for student athletes, uh, newcomer of the year. Uh, winning a Marco. So how's that feel to, to win one of the first ever Marcos? Uh, it was pretty cool. And then, the you know, just to be recognized in front of all of my fellow student athletes and my team, and then to be voted newcomer of the year by those people, um, I think that's pretty cool. And, you know, just to kind of have an impact and let my, you know, just the support from my coaches and my teammates to allow me to have that success and to be able to pitch freely on the mound and stuff and, and then to be kind of awarded for that, um, I think that's just super special. And uh, it was it was really cool. I got to go up on the stage, and um, you know everybody was kind of giving me high fives as I was going up, you know, on the stairs. And so that was kind of something uh, a little memory that I'll keep um, moving forward. My guest Sydney Nestor, uh, I'm holding her up from practice and uh, for meal time. So I better let you go. Have fun this weekend. Thanks for doing this again. And, of course, uh, I know it's going to be pretty exciting here in the next few days. But uh, first things first, uh, go get the series win against Coastal Carolina. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Go Herd. All right. There you have it. Uh, the newcomer of the year, by the way, Sydney Nestor, for um, outstanding year and her first year with the Thundering Herd. And, of course, uh, she's having an outstanding season now. When we continue – We've got comments from Marshall football coach Charles Huff. Uh, There was media availability today, so we've got his comments from that when we continue on this edition of The Drive on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Thursday, April 13th edition, The Drive on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. 
We're getting closer to the spring game and the conclusion of spring practice for the Thundering Herd. So keeping in that theme, we've got more Charles Huff for you today. Coach was on the Sun Belt Coaches Spring Media Availability earlier today. And he was asked a little bit about spring practice, and we're going to hear that in a minute. And there's one thing to know right now, though. He was asked directly about the quarterback situation. That has been a question that many of you have had. So when he was asked, you know, is the quarterback job Cam Fancher's to lose, he pretty much said if they had to play today, that Cam's the quarterback. Yeah, I mean, if we had to play today, Cam would obviously be the starter. I mean, Cole is, is making progress, but but again, you know, it's not, you know, again, if his last name wasn't Pennington, I'm not sure everyone would be making it as a competition as it is. Um, yes, there is, you know, some competition and, and, and growth. I, I talk to the guys, and I'm honest, right? If we had to play today, it would be Cam, right, Cam? And Cam was in the same situation last year, you know, where he was – you know, getting better, but not really ready. There's a lot more to do than just kind of throwing the football. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, Cam and Cole and all the the other guys kind of on our you know quarterback roster there are different. You know, so some of the things that we would do with each one of them are different. Um, some of the things, the benefits that you know, Cam gives you with the ability to, to, to move kind of cleans up some issues that you may have at other positions or whatever it may be. Some of the things that Cole and and Cade and some of those other quarterbacks in the room give you, you know, clean up some issues. So I think the biggest thing for us is is trying to find out. I tell the guys all the time, before you can be the starting quarterback, you got to be the number two quarterback. Because in order to be the number two quarterback, you got to understand patience. You got to understand preparation. You got to understand, you know, taking it one step at a time. You got to understand competing. Then you can compete for the for the starting role. And I think that's where we are now. Um, I do think that th- there are some guys making progress. Um, a big part of it, you know, is it's practice 11. So it's, it's still some some evaluating to do as far as our, our installs and things that we want to be able to put in. Um, I think I think a big part of it is going to be what they do this summer. You know, do they go back and watch all the film from the spring? Say, hey, this is where I need to improve. Um, do they get faster? Do they get stronger? Um, and then are they taking the opportunity to grow this summer? You know, hey, are they out throwing with the receivers? Are they out? you know, calling, you know, the offense up and making them, you know, do some one-on-one routes or whatever it may be to show that being the quarterback of a team is bigger than just, you know, standing behind the center and clapping your hands. You know, you, you got to be that leader. So when you step in that huddle, you step on that field, you know, the unit respects the presence that you have and ultimately plays at a higher level. So if the games were being played tomorrow, Cam Fancher's the quarterback, and uh, I'm sure that will, um, that will be up for debate for some time as we've got a lot of spring left and we've got fall camp before we get even to the first game. So Cam Fincher today would be your starting quarterback. Coach gave us a, a summary, got us caught up to where the herd is right now as we're in practice number 11, he said. We are right at uh, practice number 11. Um, so we're moving along pretty good, really impressed with how our um, team has really embraced the entire off season and spring. Um, the things that you kind of go through in year one and year two are teaching them how to practice and how to prepare and those things you're starting to see more readily, even with, you know, an influx of freshmen and transfers that have come in. Um, really impressed with, with the competitive back and forth, you know, defensively. Uh, we've got a lot of guys who are returning who played a lot of football for us at a really high level. Um, offensively, we were younger last year, not necessarily by class, but just by playing experience. Um, and a lot of guys, a lot of those guys are back. I mean, right now, um, you're starting to see in practice the the back and forth. You know, big play by the defense, big play by the offense. And it's not a lack of consistency. It's just guys are making plays. So really impressed with that. Obviously, we got a, a long way to go um, before we actually, you know, um, you know, start keeping score. Um, but we're making really good strides. Really impressed with where we are. Now, let's go back to Cole Pennington for a minute. Legacy kid, right? Chad Pennington, one of the all-time greats at Marshall University. He's the quarterback we all talk about. We say Chad Pennington, then Byron Leftwich, and then every other quarterback is up for debate. But that's the order. 
Chad Pennington, Byron Lethwich, the rest of them. So how many Herd fans want to see Marshall led by another Pennington? How many Marshall fans want to see Pennington leading the Herd to a game-winning touchdown? How many Herd fans want to see that? I would say a lot. There are a lot of Herd fans who grew up hearing about Chad Pennington, and then there are a lot of Herd fans that were there when Chad Pennington was behind the center. So that means there's a lot of pressure, directly or indirectly, because you want Cole Pennington to come out and be a Pennington, right? You want to see Pennington return to greatness on the on the field. Well, he's not Chad Pennington. He's Cole Pennington. He's his own man. And so one of the questions that was asked today is, is how do you encourage these second-generation kids? And he's not the only one. I'm just using him as the example. But you have kids who come from, well, their father played. Their father was successful. Their father has, you know, a lot of history. And people talk about him. And then you're sort of following in their footsteps to a degree. Chad Pennington was a quarterback. Cole Pennington's a quarterback. And you have lots of kids on lots of teams that are second generation or they have a a relative, probably more specifically their father, played previously and a lot of people still talk about him. So how does Coach Huff and coaches all across the country encourage these kids to try to not be in their parents' footsteps but to – to pave their own way, to to walk their own path. Yeah, it's tough because you guys compare them to their dads every day. So you guys make it really tough on us coaches to try to get them to improve and, and, and manage what they can manage. But, no, obviously it's, it's part of it, right? Most of those kids have grown up in a world where their whole life they've been the son of, you know, so they've grown up in, in a different, um, you know, scenario than a lot of, a lot of kids. Um, I think the biggest thing is, is managing expectations, you know, with them one on one, and and also being being honest about, you know, hey, there's an expectation that you got to have for yourself. There's an expectation that you got to have in house, um, and you got you really got to block out the noise. Obviously, you know, we've got some um, legacy kids on our team that whose parents played a really significant role here, um, and when the time comes, their kids will have their um, opportunities to pave their own way. Um, but the, the teaching them to understand, hey, you got to be patient, you got to be ready, um, and you got to understand that you're evaluating yourself. You're not compared to your dad's stats or your dad's production, or you know, obviously you have his bloodline and, and your mom's bloodline, but um, you you got to go pave your own way. And, and a lot of those kids who who have that kind of legacy or that shadow over them um, have kind of already built a tough skin because they've lived life like that, you know, where they've been the high school player of. Um, and, and you just got, <clears throat> excuse me, you just got to keep talking to them about it, you know, keep talking to them, keep showing them where they're making progress, keep showing them, hey, this is where you are. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, they get a chance to to be their own um, player or their own student athlete or whatever it may be. Coach Huff addressing the legacy players and, of course, you know, put it all right back on us, right? It's on us, partially on us. Finally, Coach gave us an update. Uh, he was asked about who – or which players are stepping up in the wide receiver room. And um, he outlined who he's impressed with so far and uh, where he's happy uh, with. Yeah, um, you know, what Talik Keaton's back. You know, he, he got injured, you know, towards the, the middle of the year there. So he's back. He's another veteran presence that, that has done some really good things. Brian Robinson battled some injuries last year that kind of hampered him a little bit. He's back healthy, you know, kind of looking like the, the Brian Robinson that we anticipated. Um, Caleb McMillan is, is, is back again. He got injured, uh, probably about midway through the year. So he kind of battled back. Um, and then, you know, some guys that we recruited, you know, I know in this transfer portal world, you know, we forget that we still recruit high school guys, you know, but the Caleb Coombs and, and that world of guys, you know, are starting to make some progress. And again, I think it's going to be a combination uh, of guys, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, we'll settle into some, you know, true positions and true, you know, you're the X, you're the Z, you're the Y. 
Uh, right now, we're trying to, you know, basically have them drink water of a fire hose and, you know, hey, play every position, play this position, because obviously at this level, you know, you want your best players on the field, and that week one may be different than week six, you know. So a guy that's playing inside slot receiver may have to move outside or vice versa. So I feel really good about the room as a whole. Um, I, I, I talked to one um, reporting group after practice, and, and we, we're catching more balls than we did last year. I know that sounds very uh, simplistic for the wide receiver group, but um, there's not as many balls on the ground. And I think that's a, a competitive, you know, kind of balance, and I think it's, you know, guys improving. Coach Huff from his media availability earlier today. It's time for you to be a part of this program. 304-396-TALK. 304-396-8255. That's our text line on Twitter. You still using that? I'm there. At Paul Swan. More coming up on today's edition of The Drive ESPN. 94.1 and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Thursday, April 13th edition of The Drive on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. Our text line is open 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. Let's get you caught up on what's happening tonight and what happened yesterday. As the Astros beat the Pirates yesterday 7 to nothing. Pirates back on the road tonight. They've got a series in St. Louis, 740's first pitch. We go on the air a little bit before that, right here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. Braves beat the Reds yesterday 5-4. Atlanta sweeping the series, and the Reds open up a home series with the Phillies tonight, 640. And then the Yankees beat the Guardians 4-3. Cleveland has today off, and they will open up a series tomorrow in Washington. NHL action tonight in a meaningless game. In a meaningless game, Columbus hosts Pittsburgh, as Pittsburgh uh, will not be making the playoffs. Uh, The Penguins haven't missed the playoffs in, what, I think it was 16 seasons? I could be wrong on that particular number, but it's it's been a long time since Pittsburgh has missed the playoffs. So Pittsburgh missing the playoffs. Sorry, Sidney Crosby. Um, You're not my favorite player anyway. 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. That's the number to be a part of today's edition of The Drive. That's our text line, so you can text me there, or you can find me on Twitter at Paul Swan. A couple of other big things happening today we haven't had a chance really to dive into, but Dan Snyder has agreed to sell the NFL Commander's $6 billion sale. It's a group led by Josh Harris and, and, and Mitchell Rails. And Magic Johnson is involved in this group as well. So there's an agreement in place in principle to buy the commanders from Dan Snyder. And $6 billion is the number that's come up. That's huge. If a team like the commanders could be worth $6 billion, imagine what a really good NFL team might be worth. That's huge. So the deal, of course, you know, we'll get the final deals here eventually. But if this deal is approved, Harris would own controlling stakes and teams in three of the four major North American pro sport leagues, along with uh, David Blitzer. They've owned the NBA Philadelphia 76ers since 2011 and the New Jersey Devils since 2013. And Harris has owned a piece of the Pittsburgh Steelers, which he needs to sell before getting the Commanders. That's huge. That's a lot of money. You know what the previous max was? $4.65 billion. That was set when uh, Rob Walton's group bought the Denver Broncos last year. That's huge. Absolutely. Of course, uh, Magic Johnson also owned part of the L.A. Dodgers and was also part of Harris's bid for the Broncos. A lot of money out there being thrown here. So some new ownership probably brings some new energy and life into that franchise. I've never been a Washington fan. Wasn't a Redskins fan. Never grew up a fan of Washington. Any, any Washington team. Never really grew up a fan. More of an Ohio sports team fan myself. 
New York area, Cincinnati area, as far as my pro teams are concerned. But um, that's huge. It's huge. So the NFL gets rid of a problem. Dan Snyder gets rid of a headache, makes $6 billion in the process, give or take. And I think everyone walks away happy in this deal. What could what could happen to the Washington Commanders? What worse could happen here? So it's always good to see a new ownership group come in, especially when you have a owner that maybe isn't necessarily beloved by the fan base or by a lot of people in general, especially in the ownership group, the circles there in the NFL. Of course, there are a lot of people who are not on board with Washington Commanders with the name change from Redskins to Commanders. So there, that's that's just a franchise that needs a lot of help. Absolutely needs a lot of help. The fans have not been showing up. Washington ranked last in the league in attendance in 2022 and second last in 2021. And... I don't know how they have to rebrand this team or put it out there to get fans to come back. Winning, of course, helps. Winning does help. But they might have some opportunity to make some changes. Maybe they they change the brand a little bit. I don't know if you stick with Washington Commanders. You can change that logo. I mean, honestly, have you seen the Washington logo? It's the most basic W. It's just, it's a W. It's just a basic W. I would change if I was if I was that ownership group. I would try to change something about the branding, just to give it a fresh. Even though Commanders are supposed to give it a fresh paint job, I would try to come up with something that would freshen that up a little bit more. Make it clear that this isn't your old Washington Commanders. Obviously, Redskins not coming back. So you have to come up with something to do something to bring the fans. And honestly, you're going to need a new stadium as well. You're going to need a new stadium. Is this an opportunity to move the franchise? Would moving the franchise ultimately be the best thing? I mean, you would lose having a team serving the Washington area, that that demographic, that community. You would lose that. But would that be the best thing here? I know. Not going to happen, right? 304-396-TALK, 304-396-8255. I've talked more about the Washington Commanders in this one segment than I have all year long, last year included. More coming up. It's The Drive, ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to our final segment for this Thursday, April 13th. It is The Drive on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan, and if you ever, ever want to listen to the show and you can't tune in, say, 5.06 p.m., and you want to listen to the show, don't don't fret, don't worry, we've got you covered. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Just do a search for The Drive with Paul Swan, you'll find it there. I've got links on my bio where you can find things as well on Twitter. I'm at Paul Swan, so easy way to find it. Just do a search drive with Paul Swan. You'll find it on your favorite podcasting app. Until then, we've got time for you. 304-396-TALK. That's the text line. 304-396-8255. That's the number to be a part of the program today. Uh, We were talking softball earlier with Sidney Nestor. If you did not hear the show today, earlier, You can go back. That's one you can go back and listen to later when the podcast is posted. And we alluded to Alabama coming in here. That's going to be the game 
on the 18th. There's some things you need to know. If you hadn't seen this list of things you need to know just yet, I'm going to give you a refresher. Seating is going to be first come, first serve. And I don't mean for the game against Alabama at 3.30. I mean when the herd opens the gate for the Liberty and Alabama game because Marshall will play host to the Crimson Tide facing off against Liberty. That's the first game. That's going to be at 1 p.m. So when the herd open the gates, when Marshall says, come on in, you better get your seat now. Right then and there, you better get your seat because seating is going to be first come, first serve. And Marshall Athletics will not be clearing the stadium between games. Don't worry, student-athlete families will have reserved seating. That will be denoted by signage in the grandstand area, Dot Hicks Field. Um, due to the expected capacity crowd, pets will not be permitted in grandstand areas. Fans are permitted to bring their own chairs for outfield seating only. Uh, parking is going to be available in the old ACF parking lot, which is directly across 3rd Avenue from Dot Hicks Field. It is free. Additional free parking is going to be available in the west lot of Jones C. Edwards Stadium. The bad news, no tailgating permitted in these lots. You cannot tailgate. Not permitted. Not this time. So these are some of the things you need to know since we were talking softball earlier today with Sidney Nestor. You needed to know that. Guess what? Should be a big one. Marshall taking on Alabama. The Herd's got to take care of Coastal Carolina. That's coming up first. And after that, Thundering Herd can focus on Alabama coming in. I, I think that's going to be a huge match. Marshall can win that. That's really going to set up Marshall quite nicely. I mean, Marshall's doing almost everything it needs to do to ensure a possible postseason berth, even if it doesn't win either the regular season crown or win the, the softball tournament in the Sun Belt. Marshall's going to set up quite nicely for postseason consideration. Beating Alabama is going to help that immensely. So hopefully there's a huge crowd. Sounds like there will be. And it'll be Marshall and Alabama at the dot where Marshall is very good. Near impossible to beat the herd at the dot, at least uh, in these last few years. So we'll, we'll, of course, remind you about this again tomorrow. And um, don't forget the herd on the road against Coastal Carolina. The thundering herd will hopefully sweep that series and then get that streak going again. It's a good interview. If you didn't hear it earlier, go back, get it. It's on the podcast later on tonight. If you are listening live, go back and get that. That was uh, great of her to come on today, and we're going to try to do more of that. And uh, if you haven't been uh, listening all week, you know, we've had some good stuff. John Mercer was yesterday talking a little herd tennis. A couple of days ago, we had Kim Stevens, Marshall's new women's basketball coach, jumping on with us to talk a little bit about what her plans are for the program. Also, Luke Creasy was on with us earlier this week. If you missed any of these interviews, do you want to go back and get them? I'm pushing the podcast here. I'm telling you, it's almost the best way to listen to the show. If you can't listen live, follow, like, subscribe, whatever the button says on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. And I mean that, wherever you get your podcasts. So uh, we got baseball coming up again tonight. As I mentioned, the Pirates opening up a series in St. Louis 740 will be first pitch. That game right here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. So we'll have the Pirates uh, almost the rest of the way for the summer. Looking forward to seeing if the Pirates can bounce back. I mean, it's very tough to beat the Astros. Even though the Pirates did get drilled 7-0 yesterday, it's tough. It's a tough team to beat. You don't just necessarily uh, win every game against the Astros, even though they had... Some some mild success against them. I'm not uh, I'm not too worried about that. If you're a Reds fan right now, you get swept by the Braves. The season started out so well for you, right? And now look, I know it's too soon to be talking like that. And that's going to wrap up this edition. Thanks for tuning in. If you are unable to be with me tomorrow, don't forget get that subscription to the podcast. Like, follow, whatever your whatever your button says. Hit it. 
have it come to you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll do it again tomorrow here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. Pittsburgh Pirates Baseball, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.